Hello, my name is Ian Sinjin and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the ninth in my series of Sinjin Pipecasts. The subject of our talk today is the work of the political philosopher Michael Oakeshott. Oakeshott went to school in Harpenden, which is just some three miles down the road from, which, from where I'm speaking to you now in St Albans, before going on to Cambridge where he studied history, we became a fellow, and then after a brief period at Nuffield College, Oxford, he went on to become a professor of political theory at the London School of Economics. Oakeshott wrote on philosophy, history and political theory, and today I wish to focus upon his political ideas, which are chiefly contained in two books. The first, Rationism in Politics, published in 1962, and the second, On Human Conduct, that was published in 1975. Now, politics for Oakeshott is a form of practice. Practice is the endeavour of humans to render their experience more coherent by bringing their actual world into greater conformity to the world they would like to see. Practice, therefore, is driven by desire, the desire to reconcile the world that is here and now with the world that ought to be. An example would be when I tidy my messy room so it looks rather more like the chic minimalist homes that one sees on television. I quote here Oakeshott himself. In experience, wrote Oakeshott, there is always the pursuit of a coherent world of ideas. In practice, a coherent world of experience is achieved by action by the introduction of actual change into existence. And the aspect of mind involved is the will. Practice is the exercise of the will. Practice, in other words, seeks to render experience coherent, but it can never truly realize this. No sooner do we bring one part, one part of our world into greater conformity with our desires, than another part of our world tends to diverge from what we'd like to see. Our desires are never truly satisfied. Even so, practice, driven by desire, is a necessary aspect of the human condition. And it is within the context of practice that we can and must understand politics. Politics, for Oakeshott, is the activity of facilitating, facilitating the practical endeavours of individuals within society. Each of us pursues our own individual personal desires, but in doing so, we inevitably interact with others and impact upon them. To enable such interactions to take place with minimal conflict, societies operate systems of rules, explicit or implicit. Politics is the endeavour to construct, reflect upon and amend these rules in such a way that we each of us are able to go about our practical activities with the minimal impact upon the activities of others. And again, I quote Oakeshott. Politics, he said, is the activity of overseeing the general rules of conduct within which people can pursue their own particular activities with the minimum of fuss and inconvenience to others. Now, because politics exists to serve and enhance a way of life, we must start political thinking from within a way of life. Political theory must be grounded upon the actual lived experience of the individual in society. It cannot occupy a position outside of experience and speculate about ideal forms of social organisation, in the manner of Plato, for example, in the Republic. Again and again we find Oakeshott's overriding preoccupation is the importance of avoiding abstraction. When we think in terms of abstractions, we construct simplified and unreal models of reality. This Oakeshott opposes. We need instead to ground political thinking within the actual context of the life of people within communities. Now when we consider the actual life of people acting within social contexts, we find that human interaction 
is always based upon rules. Some of these rules are explicitly written down, like laws and constitutions. But other rules are based on custom, tradition and morality. The sum of all these rules, which guide social interaction, Oakeshott calls civil association. These rules of civil association make civilised life possible. They are the rules of the game of social life. They are complex and their origins are complex. They evolve over time. They are not created at any one point in time and are not the brainchild of any one person. The rules we live by are inherited from the past and have developed over centuries. Accordingly, they have no one specific purpose and they evolve rather like the, nat rather like the natural world evolves according to Darwinian evolution. Gradually they change, as new rules are added and old ones are discarded. As such, the rules of civil association are simultaneously fixed, but also flexible. We all of us encounter these rules of how to behave as we grow up and enter the world. They are simply there. Some conventions, like queuing at the supermarket, are simply, I say, are simply conventions that we uh, observe, but others consist of laws drawn up by the state and enforced by it. Crucially, the laws of civil association are compulsory for all members of the political community. We cannot pick and choose which laws apply to us. We cannot opt out of legal rules as even those who have sought to live off-grid in the woods eventually discover. Thus, civil association is the name Oakeshott gives to the system of rules which set the framework within which individuals interact in society. These rules limit what we can all do, but they do not determine or dictate individual actions. Each of us accepts these rules, whether we like them or not, and we live within them. If we break them, then we know we'll be punished. But the rules exist to serve no particular end or purpose, and they evolve over time for countless reasons, and will continue to evolve as long as human beings exist. It is the rules of civil association that form for Oakeshott the subject matter of politics. Politics is the activity of reflecting upon and discussing the actual rules of civil association and suggesting ways in which they can be amended to better serve the purpose of allowing individuals to pursue their own personal goals in the context of other persons. Politics is thus a limited and concrete activity. It is not about constructing utopias, or ideal states, or model constitutions. It is about reflecting upon the actual rules of civil association and are suggesting amendments to those practical rules with a view to promoting the peaceful interaction of individuals, each pursuing their own diverse ends. The main threat to this form of civil association and the style of pragmatic politics that accompanies it is a rival conception of human association, namely enterprise association. An enterprise association is a form of association where individuals voluntarily join together to progress some collectively agreed goal. Examples of enterprise association would be a cricket club formed to progress the playing and enjoyment of cricket, a charity founded to pursue some agenda like preventing cruelty to animals, or a business like Ford Motors founded to make money through the production of motor cars. Enterprise associations are vital, obviously, enough to the successful functioning of any society, and a thriving civil association will include within it a myriad of enterprise associations. However, according to Oakeshott, 
the great mistake of countless numbers of political leaders and political theorists has been to apply the model of enterprise associations to civil association. There has been, in other words, a recurring tendency throughout history to view civil association in terms of the characteristics of enterprise association. Whenever this is done, the civil association that exists, if you remember, to regulate the interaction of humans in society comes to be seen as existing to realise some fixed social end. These ends can be numerous, from the glory of a king to the social justice of a communist society, from the military power of fascism to the pursuit of liberal morality, from the construction of a theocratic state to the endeavour to stop global warming. In all these cases, civil association is approached in terms of a teleological enterprise association directed towards the achievement of some particular end. Now for Oakeshaw, this conflation of civil and enterprise associations is a category error and is destructive of the very essence of what civil association is. Remember, a civil, associ a civil association is characterised by two things. First, membership of it is compulsory for all members of a political community. And second, it is an open association which exists for no particular, particular end beyond the peaceable interaction of its members. Now to convert an open, flexible civil association into a closed, rigid enterprise association subverts the essential quality of civilized civil association. And the key point is this. Membership of an enterprise association is voluntary. People freely join enterprise associations to pursue some goal they agree with. Whether it's playing cricket, campaigning to protect the environment, or working for a company. And once they have joined an enterprise association, individuals give up some of their liberty to progress this end. They agree, for example, to abide by the rules of a business or a cricket club. But crucially, they do this voluntarily. And if they don't happen to approve of cricket or wish no longer to play it, they are free not to join a cricket club. And it's precisely this freedom to join or not join which does not exist under civil association. So, once a civil association is conducted as if it were an enterprise association, everyone is forced to abide by its rules and pursue its goals, whether they want to or not. In this way, civil association becomes really a form of tyranny, dictating forms of behaviour to its members and forcing them to work towards a goal which they very might well disagree with. In a communist state, for example, all people will be forced to work towards building an equal, classless society. Either they don't endorse such a project, or we may personally worse off as a result. Those standing in the way, like the Kulak peasants in the Soviet Union who resisted agricultural collectivization, can find themselves liquidated by the communist enterprise state. In a theocratic state like Iran, everyone is forced to abide by Islamic law, whether they believe in God or Islam or not, and so on. Because the rules of civil association are binding on everyone, no one can opt out, and all must submit. It was these effects of confusing civil, associ civil and enterprise association that Oakeshott deprecated. As he wrote in a 1939 survey of European political ideas, the imposition of a universal plan of life on society is at once stupid and immoral. Hence, a large part of Oakeshott's political writing from the 1940s onwards represents an attempt to argue the case for the free, open, minimalist traditions of civil association in Britain against the attempts to use the institutions of civil association 
to realise specific enterprise goals, such as, for example, the construction of a welfare state. Now, the main factor operating in the 20th century, according to Oakeshott, to promote the understanding of civil association in terms of enterprise association, has been the cult of rationalism. And much of Oakeshott's political writing represents a critique of rationalist thinking. Now, to understand this critique, we need to be clear about one point, namely that Oakeshott is not critical of the use of reason or rational thinking in human affairs. Oakeshott approves the use of reason and advocated its deployment. But it's necessary to understand what Oakeshott means by reason. For Oakeshott, an action is rational if it is appropriate to the context in which it occurs. And let me quote Oakeshott. Rational conduct is faithfulness to the knowledge we have of how to conduct the specific activity we are engaged in. To be rational, in other words, is to know how to behave. It means quite simply how to do something. So for example, to behave rationally upon entering a supermarket is to collect one's trolley and select a number of items from the shelves and join a queue at the checkout and after paying, leave by the exit. A person who knows how to do these things knows how to behave appropriately in a supermarket and is said by Oakeshott, therefore, to be behaving rationally. Now, rationalism for Oakeshott is something very different from this. It is a tendency of thinking which emerged in the 1600s, associated particularly with Descartes and Bacon, and which pressed the superiority of abstract, theoretical, technical knowledge over practical knowledge. Oakeshott defined it as follows. Rational conduct, and by that he means rational conduct in the rationalistic sense, is behaviour deliberately directed to the achievement of a formulated purpose and is governed solely by that purpose. It has, according to Oakeshott, several defining features. First, that it is possible to approach a problem free from traditional ideas, customs and superstitions. In other words, when you're confronted with a problem, you can approach it with a clean slate from a white sheet of paper without any preconceptions. Second, that humans can arrive through rational reflection at ends to be pursued by using, for example, cost-benefit analysis. Third, on having decided which ends to pursue, reason can determine the most efficient means for realising those ends, that there is such a thing as best practice. Fourth, these best means can be distilled into a theory or strategy of action, which can be then written down in a book, what Oakeshott calls a technique. Fifth, that this best technique can be taught to others, in universities, in business schools, and that these students, inculcated in the theory, can then go out into the world to apply the techniques which they have just been taught. We might think, for example, of the kind of managerial theories developed over the 20th century, which were then taught to students in business schools and then applied in practice by management consultancy firms. Now, Oakeshott completely rechecks this rationalistic theoretic approach to understanding human action. Rational behaviour of this kind, he says, is not merely undesirable, it is in fact impossible. His main criticisms are as follows. First, rationalism totally misunderstands the nature of human knowledge, and far from being rational, it is in fact irrational. Rationalism assumes that theory can decide practice, whereas in fact it is practice that determines theory. Rationalists think they are constructing models of human behaviour based on first principles, when really they are abstracting rules of behaviour from actual practice. This is inevitable. Rationalists conceive of the mind as a mechanism for reasoning which exists independent of experience, but in fact the mind is constituted by experience and has no existence, according to Oakeshott, outside of experience. 
When rationalists think they are formulating rules of conduct independent of experience, they are actually being dis de delusional. And I quote Oakeshott here. The whole notion of the mind as an apparatus for thinking is, I believe, an error. Mind, as we know it, is the offspring of knowledge and activity. It is composed entirely of thoughts. You do not first have a mind which acquires a filling of ideas and then makes distinctions between true and false, right and wrong, reasonable and unreasonable, and then, as a third step, calls activity. Properly speaking, the mind has no existence apart from or in advance of these and other distinctions. Extinguish in a man's mind these and other distinctions. And what is, this, what, and what is extinguished is the mind itself. What is left is not a neutral, unprejudiced instrument, a pure intelligence, but nothing at all. What rationalists are in fact doing is abstracting from experience, and any such abstraction will be a simplification, and as such it will fail to capture crucial details which can only be learned by actually doing something. Reading a book on how to bake a cake will not yield the actual knowledge required to make a good cake. To learn how to make a cake it is far better to work alongside someone who knows how to make a good cake and to learn from them the myriad of details and adjustments not contained in any, in any cookbook. Similarly, the best way to learn how to ride a bike or go shopping or conduct a scientific experiment is not to read a book about it, but to do it. Practical knowledge is a better guide as to how to act in any situation than technical knowledge and is therefore more rational in a true sense. Because remember for Oakeshott, rational conduct is conduct appropriate to a context, and the best way to learn appropriate action in a context is to be in that context alongside someone who shows and knows how to do it. Reading a book about it is theoretical knowledge that will never fully replicate the conditions required to act in the most uh, appropriate way in a given context. It's not therefore truly rational in Oakeshott's sense of the term. Secondly, the rational models developed by theoreticians tend always to solidify into rigid ideologies, which prevent the people from holding them from understanding reality as it truly is. People become wedded to their theory. They teach it and they learn it, and the theory becomes a reality in their own minds. Facts are then ignored in the light of the theory. It's like facts are interpreted in light of the theory, and if they don't fit they're ignored or explained away. Marxism is a classic example of this phenomenon. The theory of Karl Marx predicted global capitalist crises and working class revolution. And when these failed to materialize, uh, thinkers subscribing to Marxist ideology, such as Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg, uh, had the problem of, of trying to explain why Marxist theory had not been realized in practice. And their solutions were to say that Marx's predictions were still correct, they'd simply been postponed. The inevitable capitalist crisis and the overthrow of capitalism had been, had been postponed due to various uh, further developments, such as, for example, imperialism, with its kind of imperial super profits enabling capitalism to get a new lease of life. The point was here that instead of theory, the Marxist theory adjusting to fit the facts, the facts were adjusted to fit the theory. And the gap between theory and reality therefore becomes ever larger. The third criticism uh, that uh, Oakeshott made of rationalist thinking is that rationalist thinking powerfully reinforces the tendency to view civil association as enterprise association. Technocrats, armed with slide rules, theoretical manuals, computers and spreadsheets, believe they can arrive at the rational goals of society and then formulate the methods by which society can best achieve these ends. Of course, as we have seen, to approach a political community in terms of goals, strategies and plans is to turn an open, flexible, uh, non-prescriptive civil association into an enterprise association. Hence, we have seen governments seeking to build a welfare state, or combat climate change, or build a European Union, and so forth. In this way, each individual is conscripted to play their part in the delivery of the rational plan formulated by politicians and their technical experts. 
This rationalist tendency to social planning was something Oakeshott saw as encouraged, of course, by the mobilisation of resources during World War II, and it was something that he thought to resist being carried over into peacetime, and for two reasons. First, since no rational plan is ever really rational, as it is based on theoretical rather than practical knowledge. Hence the fact that most great political plans end either in failure or disaster. Second, to realise rational plans, all individuals must be forced to abide by the rules of the planner, thereby sacrificing individual liberty to the goals of technocratic rationalists. And this was the path which Hayek called the road to serfdom. In short, rationalism as a system of technical theory is incoherent and illiberal, since it promotes abstract over concrete knowledge and tends to the suppression of individual agency in order to realise the goals of leaders, civil servants and experts. OK, so the critical edge of Oakeshott's thinking is, I hope, uh, clear from what I've said so far. But what is Oakeshott's own personal political philosophy? What did Oakeshott himself actually himself believe in? Well, this is not transparent, and Oakeshott was deliberately wary of expounding a political ideology for precisely the reasons that we have outlined. Still, there are some aspects of political conduct which Oakeshott favoured, and which, when brought together, add up, I think, to a coherent political philosophy and one which can be categorised, I think, as essentially liberal, but with a conservative respect for the value of inherited tradition. Let me outline the main elements of Oakeshott's positive political doctrine. In the first place, I would put, number one, uh, the value of individual freedom. Oakeshott attaches great significance to the freedom of the individual. Now, by the freedom of the individual, he means that when an individual undertakes an action, they are able to give an intelligible explanation of why they did that thing. They speak as if the action were freely choos chosen and that they could have done otherwise. Now, of course, whether humans really do possess free will, we cannot know. But we think and act as if we do. And this is what distinguishes human beings from objects in the natural world. This capacity for intelligible self-reflection. Now since self-reflecting free action is what defines us as human beings, Oakeshott values it and wants to promote such opportunities for free action. The more able people are to set their own goals and realise them without interference, the more free and human they are, and this they value, and so does Oakeshott. Second, the value of civil association. We have defined civil association as a set of rules governing the conduct of individuals in society, rules which have evolved over time to regulate the interaction between persons, but not determining the exact forms that interaction should take, and not formulated to realise any specific end, like communism, liberalism, fascism or whatever. Oakeshott considers civil association to be the most appropriate form of human association at the level of the state. It is open, pluralistic, flexible, and it allows diverse individuals to pursue diverse goals within a civilised social structure. This is not only good for the individual, but is good for the community, because the flexibility and openness of civil association promotes growth and evolution in a way that teleological enterprise states do not. As we have seen, Oakeshott is very concerned to argue that civil association should not be converted into enterprise association, with the resulting suppression of freedom and diversity. Third, Oakeshott values toleration and pluralism. A civil association requires toleration and pluralism if it is to properly function at all. A civil association sets the rules for life, but it does not dictate how the game of life is to be played. There is no fixed truth, no final goal. Instead, individuals are free to pursue their own ends, 
and form their own enterprise associations. Politics, he believed, was a form of conversation, which he called an unrehearsed intellectual adventure among individuals. It is not a dogmatic lecture or harangue designed to bend one person to another's viewpoint. Fourth, Oakeshott advocated a minimalist state. A civil association state will be a limited one. Its role is to oversee the rules of social interaction, not to determine how people will live their lives. The state should interfere as little as possible with the free actions of individuals in society. It should not seek to set goals for society or set to mould people to some ideal formulated by their rulers. Hence, for example, the state should sustain a broadly free market approach to the economy. Letting individuals spend their own money or invest in whichever way they choose and not seek to pursue some economic policy like promoting social welfare or targeting some rate of economic growth or eliminating the use of carbon. These are all, are all examples of enterprise thinking and require suppressing the free action of individuals in the pursuit of goals which are not truly rational since they are abstract and theoretic. Fifth, politics for Oakeshott involves looking for what he called intimations. Civil associations evolve over time and the role in this context of political leaders, according to Oakeshott, is to identify and facilitate developing trends. All rules will eventually gradually change, but they should do so in the context of a continually evolving civil association. There should be piecemeal amendments to a system, not a radical change imposed on a system. And I quote Oakeshott, Politics is the art of knowing where to go next in the exploration of an already existing traditional kind of society. An example Oakeshott gives is the extension of votes to women in Britain in 1918. Giving women the vote in 1918 was totally within the developing pattern of recognising the legal status of women as it evolved during the 19th century. In 1918, the moment was ripe for granting women the vote, and it occurred with little opposition. Whereas a proposal to give women the vote, say, a hundred years before, would not have been ripe and would have been very unlikely to pass. Today, we might say, for example, extending the right to vote to 16-year-olds is intimated within our current political and social traditions and could be reasonably pursued by legislators. Sixth, Oakeshott advocated respect for tradition in politics. Now, Oakeshott is usually thought of as a conservative thinker. This is not true in the sense that he is subscribed to conservative ideologies calling, for example, for a restoration of monarchical rule, or a return to nature, or the re-establishment of feudal social structures. Such cosmic Toryisms are classic examples of the kind of enterprise state mentalities which Oakeshott rejected. But Oakeshott was conservative in the value he attached to tradition. Remember, for Oakeshott, rational action is action that emerges out of a concrete practice. The existing political practice of society is just such a concrete practice, and Oakeshott respects it as such. There is a practical wisdom in knowing how to do something, and our current system of government has evolved through practice over hundreds of years, and contains more practical know-how that can be arrived at through abstract political speculation on the just society or the model design for a constitution. As Oakeshott says, a conservative is someone who appreciates what exists and attaches more value to what is known and works than to what some theorist might speculate will make society better. And I quote Oakeshott, To be conservative, then, is to prefer, is to prefer the familiar to the unknown, to prefer the tried to the untried, fact to mystery, the actual to the possible, the limited to the unbounded, the near to the distant, the sufficient to the superabundant, the convenient to the perfect, present laughter to utopian bliss. 
So Oakeshott's conservatism is pragmatic and practical and sees the art of government as emerging out of an existing traditions rather than the pages of some work of political philosophy or organisational theory. OK, let me then try to sum up. First thing I can say, I think, is that the key organising principle in Oakeshott's conception of politics is the importance of civil association. A civil association is a political community structured according to a set of rules that govern how individuals are, are interact with each other. All societies possess such rules, which make any kind of orderly, civilised life possible. Civil association is a concrete fact of experience. But it is also for Oakeshott an ideal in the sense that it is the best way to maintain a progressive, civilised, open and pluralistic community. As such, civil association needs to be defended against the recurring propensity of political leaders, technocrats and pressure groups to hijack civil association and take it into an enterprise association for the pursuit of particular ends. These attempts to organise society to realise certain ends are always destructive of individual liberty. They are also always flawed, since no humans can possibly know what is the best future course for society, and the knowledge of how to act politically at any given moment in time can only be arrived at through the actual conduct of practical politics. It cannot be known through some rationalist theory. A wise politician, therefore, ought to confine themselves not to constructing utopias, but to overseeing the operation of the rules of civil association and amending them where amendment is required. In this way, politics is both important and limited. It exists to support an actual way of life of free individuals, and not to impose upon such individuals a way of life that political leaders believe is superior. So, Oakeshott's essential objectives are liberal in a classical sense, to uphold individual liberty, or what is sometimes called negative freedom, within a community subject to the rule of law. But his methods are conservative, in the sense of prioritising customary practice as a guide to action over theoretical abstract. Rationism. Thank you for listening to this pipe call.